First of all, on behalf of the National Park Service, let me welcome you to Gettysburg National Military Park. My name is Ranger Carlton Smith, and I'll be with you about the next hour or so uh, talking about the care of the wounded. Before I get started, we always like to make sure you have a copy of the summer brochure that lists all the free ranger programs we have and a park, and a park map. Uh, if you need either one, uh, they're available at the information desk uh, right inside the visitor center. Uh, tonight at 8.30, we will have a campfire program, uh, provided we don't get a thunderstorm like we did last night. And tonight, uh, Evans is going to be talking about the impact of the battle on the civilians of Gettysburg. As long as the campfire programs have something to do with the Civil War, we have a pretty wide range to talk about. And so those topics change every night, depending on who is doing it. Okay. On this particular program, rather than give you, and, and no pun intended, a shotgun approach uh, to Civil War medicine, uh, I thought I'd look at it through the eyes of one individual who was served here at Gettysburg as an Army surgeon. And that's Dr. Justin Dwinell from Cosnovia, New York. Uh, Dr. Dwinell was 41 years old in 1863. When he decided in his youth he wanted to become a doctor, there were two ways he could do it. He could go to medical school. But back then, medical schools did not require any pre-med. So he didn't have a background in chemistry, biology, anything like that. The course of instruction was usually three years. And a lot of times the third year was a repeat of the second year. But once you got through that three year of, of instruction, uh, you took an exam, if you passed it, you could hang out your single and be a doctor. Or you could do what Dr. Dwinell did, and that is he served in an apprenticeship where he worked for a local doctor, made house calls with him, saw how he diagnosed illnesses, the medicines he recommended for treatment, read the doctor's medical journals, any textbooks uh, he might have, and then again after a few years, uh, when he felt he had enough knowledge, He'll take a state board exam, pass it, and hang out a single. We do know that Dr. Dunell applied for the Albany Medical School in New York and Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia. On both applications that he put down, he was already a practicing physician. So he's trying to go back to school for postgraduate work, in a sense. In In June of 1861, uh, Dr. Nell is going to become an assistant surgeon with the 72nd Pennsylvania. Three months later, in September of 1861, he's appointed a full surgeon with the rank of major and reassigned to the 106th Pennsylvania. And that's the regiment he'll be attached with, attached to for the rest of the war. Now, Dr. Dwinell like every other civilian going in, is quickly going to learn that there's the civilian way of doing things and the Army way of doing things. And the Army has various manuals for the doctors to follow. One of the people to now we have to supervise is the hospital steward. The hospital stewards were reasonably intelligent enlisted men who served as sort of the Civil War equivalent of an EMT. But they don't get near the training EMTs are going to get today. Every regiment in the field will have one full surgeon, one assistant surgeon, and one hospital steward. So since Dornell has to supervise him, he better know it's in the hospital steward's manual so he can do it correctly. There's also a manual up here. On, it's a manual for medical officers and a combination the preservation of health in armies and instructions for military surgeons. This explains in about 12 pages uh, the procedures to follow when you're examining recruits. And according to Army regulations, every recruit was supposed to be examined stripped. And then this, in over 30 pages, goes into more detail of what the doctor is supposed to look for during the examination. And of course, we know that military surgery is different than civilian surgery. And so there's a manual out of military surgery. This was actually printed in Richmond uh, and done by a Confederate doctor. But neither side was above taking a good book like this, and in this case, taking the doctor's name off, 
reprinting it in New York and handing it out to union surgeons. So it's a pretty good textbook for military surgery. To what now is also going to find out that its main job isn't necessarily taking care of the wounded. It's taking care of sick soldiers. And that can be a major task back in the day before anybody knew anything about germs, viruses, bacteria, anything like that. One reason a doctor thought people got sick was an imbalance in body fluids, between good body fluids and bad body fluids. Before the Civil War, to get the bad blood out, the doctors would actually bleed a patient. And that's why they'd actually take a knife, cut a vein open, and bleed the person until they turned white. Doctors thought that was a good complexion. Fortunately, by the time of the Civil War, they've gone away from that. But they still want to try to draw some of that bad blood out. So most doctors will have a tin like this with a little friend of theirs in it. And you want to take a guess what's in here? You know what's in there? You know what it is? It's a leech. Now this is actually a rubber one. But if you wanted to draw some of that bad blood out, you put the leech on the vein, the leech will suck up the blood, and when he has enough to fall off, you put him back in the case and get ready for the next patient. Doctors still use leeches today. If you were to lose your finger somehow, and the doctors can reattach it, they're going to place a leech at the attachment point. And that leech in sucking up the blood will stimulate the circulation. We also know that leeches exude an enzyme that helps with blood coagulation. But I don't think doctors today just go down to the local swamp and get a leech. They're medically grown now for that purpose. Also, the soldiers aren't too particular about where they get their drinking water sometimes. On the march up here, one soldier said the only source of water they found to fill their canteens was a pond off to the side of the road. He also said that pond had green scum on top of it and mosquitoes flying around it. So he said they simply pad the top of the, of the pond to chase the mosquitoes out, press this green scum off to the side, then duck their canteens in to fill them up with water. And most people know one item of food the soldiers ate, especially on campaign. You know? Um, hardtack. Hardtack. Hardtack is nothing more than flour and water baked twice into a hard cracker. And one day's ration of hardtack is 10 of those crackers. Now, one soldier did say when hardtack was fresh, it could be pretty nutritious, but it wasn't always fresh. Uh, some of the stuff was left over from the Mexican War, about 12 years before the Civil War. So if you got it, it might be a little moldy. If it was moldy, you could turn it in and get a fresh supply. Every once in a while, though, you get a ration of hardtack, it would actually have little critters crawling around inside of it. Unless it was completely infested, you had to keep it. What the soldiers would do then is break up the hardtack with the butt end of the rifles and then put the piece in a cup of coffee. As the coffee started to get hot, those little critters would come to the surface. The soldiers then would skim the surface off, drink the coffee, and eat the hardtack. One soldier said the only time they saw a ration of fresh meat is when they got a ration of hardtack. So it's no wonder that the leading illness in the Civil War is going to be chronic diarrhea, or excuse me, acute diarrhea that one disease is going to account for 1,155,000 cases. Now, fortunately, they only had a little less than 3,000 deaths. One of the leading causes of death, though, is going to be chronic diarrhea. The doctors reported 170,000 cases of that disease. And of that number, over 27,500 are going to die. Another leading cause of death by disease was typhoid. The only reported a little over 75,000 cases, but of that number, again, over 27,000 are going to die. A death rate of almost 36%. And if you came down with diarrhea, uh, to give you an idea of the state of medicine back then, uh, the doctors might want to give you a laxative to flush the body out. Okay.
They would also might give you something called calomel, which comes in either a blue pill or a blue liquid. The reason for the color blue is the main ingredient in calomel was mercury. Same stuff you find in a thermometer, which is poison. A young lady working as a nurse in Washington, D.C., named Louise May Alcott, uh, came down with typhoid, and the doctors gave her calomel. She had to go home, apparently recovered from the disease, and then 20 years later, died of stomach cancer. And the folks up in, uh, up in Concord, Massachusetts, her hometown, are convinced she got the stomach cancer from the calomel. So sometimes in the long run, the cure was worse than the disease. But of course here at Gettysburg, Dwinell's main responsibility is taking care of wounded soldiers. By the time the Union Army of the Potomac arrives in Gettysburg, they have a good system in place for taking care of the wounded. And it's all because of their medical director, Dr. Jonathan Letterman. Dr. Letterman's system was so good, its basic outline, it's still being used by the military today. Back in the Civil War, if you're wounded on the firing line, the first thing that's going to happen is men designated from your regiment will drag you back about 100 yards or so to a place of relative safety. And all they're going to do at that point is stress the wound and give you a good dose of laudanum, a liquid painkiller made from opium. Then stretcher bearers will come up, carry you back about another 500 yards to the ambulances. The ambulances will then go to the rear about another mile and a half to the field hospitals. It's at the field hospitals the doctors will do any necessary operations. As soon as they can, you'll be transferred from the field hospital to a regular Army General Hospital in a major city like Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, someplace like that. And hopefully once at the General Hospital, you'll be able to achieve a full recovery. The field hospitals themselves are going to be organized at the division level. And to understand that, it helps to understand how an army is organized. When you talk about a Civil War army, you want to start with a regiment. And a regiment at full strength should be about 1,000 officers and men. There's usually three to four regiments in a brigade, three to four brigades in a division, three to four divisions in an army corps, and two to seven corps make up an army. Now here at Gettysburg, the regiments were averaging just over 300 men apiece. So a brigade were averaged between 1,200 and 1,500 men. Dr. Dunell himself is going to be in charge of the second division hospital of the Union Army Second Corps. And he's going to set up his hospital at the Sarah Pazin farm on the Tawny Town Road behind us, just south of where we are right now. Dornell will have two assistants with him. One is to make sure the hospital has all the supplies they need. Food, medicines, bandages, stretchers, tents, blankets, things like that. The other assistant is to record the names of all the wounded who come into the hospital, how they were wounded, what treatment they received, and what the final disposition was. Going out to the field with the regiments are probably going to be some of the hospital stewards and the assistant surgeons. Anybody who's left, the four surgeons, any assistant surgeons, any hospital stewards, nurses, people like that, are supposed to report to the division hospital. From the four surgeons then, to a now we'll pick three to be the operators. The guy's actually doing the operations. And he's supposed to base his decision not on seniority, but on ability. So if he's got some crackerjack young surgeons there, they're the ones doing the operations. And the senior surgeons are helping out in any other way they can. As I mentioned, Dwinell set up his hospital early in the morning. Well, he had his hospital set up by 11 o'clock in the morning of July 2nd. The wounded start coming in about 11 o'clock, mainly from the skirmish line. And by the end of the day, he's, had, he's recorded over 500 wounded. And he's able to handle that amount of wounded at the hospital. 
on July 3rd, they're going to get some food supplies. One of the things that happened when the Army Commander, General Meade, ordered the Army to Gettysburg, he ordered all the wagons off the road except ammunition wagons and ambulances. He didn't mean the order to apply to the hospital supply wagons, but the officers enforcing the orders do. So when Dwinnell arrives on the battlefield, for example, the only supplies he has are what he brought with him and any supplies they have in the ambulances. And that's it. General Meade finds out the mistake, orders those wagons up here, but most of them don't arrive in the field until late on July 3rd or sometime on July 4th. As far as getting some food supplies, they are trying to get food from wherever they can. Dr. Donnell reported, for example, that in the field next to where the hospital tents were, they found a bull. And so he said they were able to provide every wounded soldier with beef bouillon soup from that, cat, from that bull that they got. No information that they actually paid the farmer for it, but that's what they, that's what they were able to find. On July 30, also reported that from early in the morning until noon, the operating surgeons would work constantly at four different tables. Now remember I said they had three operators. If they actually have four tables going, it probably means to now himself is jumping in to do some of the operations. One surgeon also reported that his stint at an operating table like this was 22 straight hours here at Gettysburg. By the end of the battle on July 3rd, the Confederate commander, General Rob D. Lee, knows he has no choice but to retreat. He starts his retreat on July 4th, and the last element of his army leave by noon of July 5th. His opponent, General Meade, is now also laying plans to follow him. But now Dr. Letterman has some decisions to make. One of the things he's going to do is consolidate the division hospitals into core hospitals. So the three division hospitals of the Second Corps are now brought together into one core hospital under the direction of Dr. Dwinell. Letterman also has to make a decision about how many doctors to leave behind. The army's off in pursuit of General Lee. There might be another major battle. So the 650 doctors, how many do you leave behind and how many do you take with you? And Dr. Letterman's going to decide to leave behind 105 surgeons to take care of roughly 21,000 wounded. The rest went with the Army. They do wire worsened for 50 additional surgeons to come to Gettysburg. And now that the armies have left, civilian doctors start showing up. The Army doctors, though, don't have a high opinion of those civilians. First of all, they thought the civilians were coming here to practice their skills on the soldiers more than anything else. They also know that some of the civilians, uh, civilian doctors, seem more concerned about their comfort than the comfort of the wounded. So for the most part, it's just going to be the Army surgeons doing the operations. There are a few exceptions, but it's mostly Army surgeons working on the wounded. On July 6th, we now reports he had over a thousand soldiers at his hospital who weren't wounded. These were soldiers kind of straggled in as the army was leaving, and they're using his food supplies mainly. So he's trying to get in touch with the provost guard to come in and get those guys out of there so he can focus just on the wounded. By mid-July, the core hospitals are going to be consolidated into one general hospital called Camp Letterman on the York Road. So largest general hospital established in the field during the Civil War. And that doesn't close down officially until November 20th, 1863, the day after the dedication of the National Cemetery. Now, now is going to report that he registered at his core hospital 3,260 wounded, including 952 Confederate soldiers. So you might ask how the doctors on both sides train the wounded. For the most part, the doctors on both sides don't care about the color of the uniform. All they care about is the soldier's need. There are individual cases 
of doctors taking care of their wounded first and then the enemy. I've even read an extreme account of a surgeon from the Union Army 6th Corps who refused to treat a wounded soldier, a wounded Union soldier, because he was from the 5th Corps. So there's a doctor, he's not even treating a Union soldier because he's from the wrong corps, in a sense. And, but also keep in mind uh, that there is a VIP structure, even in the Civil War. One soldier visiting the Reynolds Hospital noticed that in the open field next to the operating tents, he said there were privates, corporals, sergeants, lieutenants, captains, majors, lieutenant colonels from Alabama, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Massachusetts, Mississippi, and New York. All they out there waiting their turn for the surgeons. But if you're a colonel or above, you're probably not laying out here because you're going to get VIP treatment. One of the soldiers getting VIP treatment from Dr. Dunnell is Colonel William Gibson of the 48th Georgia. Colonel Gibson had been severely wounded in the thigh and captured on July 2nd. And he ends up at Dr. Dunnell's hospital. I don't know exactly what Dunnell did, but it must have been something pretty good. Because Colonel Gibson does not pass away until April 5th of 1893, 30 years after the battle. And shortly after he was wounded, uh, he wrote a letter appraising Dr. Dunnell. He said, Dr. Dunnell has done all for me that I could wish, and his kindness to me would never be forgotten. He has the will and the sense to do his whole duty to his fellow man, and is an upright, just, and honorable gentleman. And the colonel even underlined those three adjectives to give them emphasis. On July 4th, we now have been told that the trains uh, coming into Gettysburg from the east are going to be operating. And he can start sending wounded out there to be evacuated. On July 7th, he gets the official word that the trains are running. And he starts thinking about this. He's had wounded laying east of town for up to three days. And he has no idea if they received food, water, medical care, or anything like that. But on the 7th, they do start to evacuate the wounded. And they got out a little over 800 wounded. On the 8th, they got out 640. On July 9th, the chief of U.S. Military Railroad arrives in town. And he is not happy with the pace or the efficiency of the evacuation. So he completely reorganizes everything to meet his standards. And on the morning here ride of July 9th, they evacuate over 1,000 wounded. In the afternoon, they got another 1,000 out. So by July 10th, they evacuate over 4,000 Union wounded from the battlefield. And when you consider the Army just left Gettysburg three or four days before, that's a remarkable achievement, all things considered. Tornell is going to report, though, although I have not yet reliable data, I am forced to the conviction that the number of deaths has been unusually large. I attribute this to the exhausted condition of the men at the time of the battle, to the unusual severity of the wounds and of their exposure previous to being got under shelter. To understand what Trunell and these surgeons are up against, it helps to understand the things that will cause wounds. And one of the things that will cause wounds is artillery. Artillery can fire four different types of ammunition. They can fire something called solid shot, and this is what it implies. This would be a solid piece of iron weighing about 12 pounds. Solid shot in the open field is normally used to try to dismount a cannon, uh, knock holes in the wall, try to knock down a building, something like that. You normally didn't use solid shot against an advancing line of infantry because that infantry's coming at you in two lines or two ranks. So if you fight into that, you might knock out two guys. And that's it. But if you could fire down the line, then you could use solid shot. One Confederate officer said during Pickett's charge, after they crossed the Emmitsburg Road, they got hit in the right flank by a piece of solid shot. And he claimed that one shot 
took out a dozen men and cut one of them completely in half. They can also fire something called shale, which is like solid shot, only it's hollow on the inside. And this hollow spot is going to be filled with black powder. This is designed to explode over the heads of enemy soldiers and come apart into six or eight pieces like this. So you're going to have these jagged pieces of metal raining down on top of you. They could also find a case shot, which is like the shell, only instead of the hollow spot being filled with just black powder, it was also filled with metal pellets. The case shot is designed to explode 50 to 75 yards in front of a moving line of men and roughly 10 yards in the air. The reason for firing short is that means the enemy is moving into your line of fire. And that's more psychologically damaging than the case starts blowing up behind the line. The last type of ammunition the cannon can fire is something called canister. And canister is nothing more than a tin can filled with 32 iron pellets. The tin cans are designed to disintegrate when the cannon's fired. So you try to turn your cannon into a giant shotgun. And that's for ranges of under 600 yards. If the enemy gets to below 300 yards, the cannoneers will begin to fire double and triple charges of canister. Meaning two or three of those 10 cans shoved into the muzzle of one gun and all fired at the same time. Depending on the size of cannon you have, the, the pellets inside a round of canister were vary in size from the size of a large marble all the way up to the size of a golf ball. Maybe something a little bigger than that, weighing about one ounce. Other things that cause wounds on the battlefield would be swords and bayonets. And of course the bayonet is designed to fit it on the end of your rifle and use it as a stabbing weapon. And some people wonder how often the soldiers really like using that. Because unlike shooting at somebody from 500 yards away, to use the bayonet, you've got to look them right in the eye. And that's a little different. But the bayonet has some famous uses here at Gettysburg. On the afternoon of July 2nd at a place called the Wheatfield, Colonel Harrison Jefferson of the 4th Michigan is going to be bayoneted to death trying to save his regimental flag. The Dodgers of these filled hospitals are going to contend that out of every hundred wounded they saw, maybe only three were wounded by swords, bayonets, or artillery fire. So some people have concluded artillery fire wasn't that effective if less than 3% of the wounded are from artillery. The counter argument though is if you're hit by something like this, you're probably not in shape to see a doctor to begin with. And also, artillery was a psychological weapon. So if your artillery can get, just get troops to stop and not come forward, the artillery is not its job, whether you've mowed down thousands of men or whatever. So long as you just get them to stop and not come forward, you've done your job. Dodgers will maintain that the filling hospitals, 97 out of every 100 wounded are going to be wounded by what's called a 58 caliber mini ball. It's about that big, cone shaped, with three rings around the base. The mini ball is designed to be fired by a rifled musket. And the rifled musket itself was designed so you could hit a target the size of a man on horseback at 600 yards. And at 1,000 yards, the rifled musket would still put that bullet through four inches of soft pine. So it's a very deadly weapon in the right hands. So let's say, for example, we've got a wounded soldier. And this is usually the point of the program where I ask for volunteers. Any volunteers? I've got one, two, anyone else? No? Okay. Now I'll tell you what, because everybody's over here, let me shove, move some things down. Okay, then you go to lean back. Okay, and if you want to grab her right ankle, okay? Okay. 
her right ankle. There you go. We want to make sure you're operating the right leg. Okay? <laughs> now, this soldier's been wounded with the firing line. As I said, when that happens, the first thing that's going to happen is this soldier will be dragged back uh, by some of his comrades to the dressing station. And all they're going to do there is dress the wound and give the soldier a good dose of laudanum. Then he's going to be picked up by stretcher bearers, taken back to the ambulances, who are bringing him to the field hospital. And this soldier is going to be 10 with set in the lower leg. Okay? That's why this soldier has priority for both the ambulances and the operating table. If she had been hit in the head by a shell fragment, she might still be out of the dressing station. Or if she made it back to the hospital, we might have her laying out here in the hot sun until we can get to her. A fractured skull wound had a mortality rate of roughly 87%. An abdominal wound had a mortality rate of roughly 86%. They figured those people were going to die. They figured those people were going to die anyway, so we're not going to waste time on them. And it was at the field and hot, at the dressing station, it was a triage operation to determine who they can help right away, uh, who can wait, and who they can't help. Now, some people think, you know, based on today's standards, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because today, a head wound, a stomach wound, you'd rush those people back right away. And a soldier hitting the leg he might be the one waiting a little bit, depending on how bad it is. But there's no internal medicine back then, no internal surgery. So it's all external. That's why these guys hitting the extremities have a priority. And by the time the soldiers have been brought up here, we've stripped off most of the uniform. These guys have been in campaign mode for about a month. Uh, they probably haven't had a chance to change their clothes, anything like that. So the uniform itself is going to be dusty, dirty, muddy, covered with perspiration and sweat. Uh, these guys have been in combat, so the uniform has this black powder residue all over it, and the guy's been wounded. So we at least knew enough to get that stuff off so we could operate. And also the first priority up here is not necessarily amputation. If we can save the leg, that's what we want to do. So the soldier's going to be brought up here, probably given another good dose of laudanum, and we'll take a hypodermic syringe filled with morphine and spray that around the wound opening. And then we have to try to find the bullet. Okay? So to find the bullet, we'll take a probe. Now, these are the same instruments we use for everybody else. If this probe gets a little bloody or, or dirty, we'll try to wipe it off on the apron. If that doesn't work, we might throw in a bucket of cold water and go from there. So these are, these are undisinfected instruments that we're using. And you also notice this particular probe is curved a little bit uh, by accident from overuse. So it might not follow the path of the bullet. If the doctors didn't want to use this, what do you think they might use instead? What do you think they would use? What do you think they might use? Do I help him? Finger. A finger. So the doctor might take his undisinfected finger and probe into the wound to find the bullet. Now, even though uh, a French chemist named Louis Pasteur and an English doctor named Dr. Joseph Lester, in the years after the Civil War, uh, Pasteur came up with the germ theory of medicine, and Joseph Lester started to disinfect his instruments with a form of carbolic acid. Most European doctors are going to buy into that because they started repeating the experiments and everything else. Most American doctors, especially they served in the Civil War, aren't buying it. Even in 1881, when President James Garfield is shot at Union Station in Washington, D.C., of course, he's now laying on the, on the floor of the train station, which couldn't be very clean to begin with. The first dog on the scene had earned his experience in the Civil War. And the first thing he does is take his undisinfected finger and probe into the president's wound to find the bullet. He can't find it. The second dog on the scene does the same thing, and he can't find the bullet. They get the president back to the White House, and they now start taking undisinfected probes, probing the president to find the bullet. And they never found it. 
they actually resorted to calling down a young man named Alexander Graham Bell, who besides inventing the telephone, has also developed the first generation metal detector. So he brought him down, he passes one over the president, and it's hitting metal all over the place. What they didn't tell Bell was that the president was not on a feather mattress. He was on a brand new first generation spring mattress. So yeah, he's picking up metal all over the place. It wasn't until the president died that they found the bullet. And they found it in the fleshy part of the body. Hadn't hit any major organs or anything. So at his trial, the guy who shot the president tried to bring up the point that yes, I shot the president, but I didn't kill him. All these doctors probing with undisinfected probes caused an infection which killed the president. It was one of those nice try, the jury didn't buy it. Guys convicted and hanged of shooting the president. Anyway, so it takes American doctors, especially some of those from the Civil War, a long time to buy in this idea that infection is bad for the patient. And you have to get rid of it before you even start operating. So that's what they're doing here with all these undisinfected instruments. If we find the bullet, we're going to try to take it out. And that's where we take a pair of forceps, go into the wound, and try to pull out the bullet. If the bones are still basically intact, that's all we're going to do. We'll wrap the wound and probably put the soldier out in the field someplace. Okay? But of course, whenever we do this for a program, we always determine that the legs, the bones down here are so badly shattered, the only way to save the patient's life is with an amputation. So you're going to grab her ankle again, okay? And normally this is where the third person comes in, because the third person will administer the anesthesia. And we have a tin can out here representing chloroform. So you pour a little chloroform on a piece of cloth, hold the cloth over the patient's nose and mouth, and it's going to go under. And then that assistant has the job of making sure the patient stays under during the operation without giving them too much chloroform because there were quite a few deaths from chloroform during the Civil War. The doctors do have access to ether to put patients out, but ether has one property chloroform doesn't. It's flammable. And if you're doing these operations at night and your only source is an open flame, you don't want anything flammable around. They probably had less deaths from chloroform than you might expect because these operations are being done in a tent out in the open. So there's a breeze going. But like I said, with 8,000 dead on the battlefield, a ton and a half of manure, it's not going to be a fresh breeze. But at, least, but at least it's a breeze going to dissipate all this stuff. So now that the patient is being put under, we would also take a tourniquet to put on the patient's leg. And this is kind of a simple tourniquet. It's just a wood block on a piece of string. And what we would do is take this, tie it up high in the thigh with a wooden block on the inside, and then pull this as tight as we can. That's going to force the artery up against the thigh bone and cut off the circulation. So now we're ready to start the operation. And let's say we decide we're going to amputate the leg right about here. From there we come down about two inches to make our first cut. And we're going to do it with a scalpel like this. And all we're going to do, I'm not going to actually cut you. <laughs> all we're going to do is make a circular cut through the skin. And that's it. Then while another assistant is standing by the doctor, we're cut up between the skin and the muscle. And that assistant will pull that flap of skin back so we have a two inch flap of skin when we're done. That's going to expose the muscle. Because the muscle is a lot tougher than the skin, we need a bigger knife. And that's when we pull out the actual amputating blade. Now some doctors said they could cut both the skin and the muscle with this one knife. But it took a very skilled surgeon to do that. Also one union general 
in visiting a field hospital noted that between operations, he saw some of the doctors doing this. Not the most sanitary thing, but it was a convenient place to put it. And now starting this time on the edge of the flap of skin, and again starting with a circular motion, was starting to cut through the muscle. Because the muscle runs around the bone, we might have used a sawing motion to cut all the muscle away. Once we've done that, we've exposed the bone itself. And this is the fun part. We can now dig out the capital saw. This is why doctors call it saw bones. You now take the saw and again cutting the edge of the flap of skin, you saw through the bone and amputate the leg. At which point this soldier would take the amputated limb, walk off a hundred yards or so, and throw it off on the pile with all the other amputated limbs. Eventually we have a wagon coming up to take those limbs off for burial. And by the time the wagon comes back, we have another supply for them. Now we're not done yet. Whenever you cut wood or bone, you have little splinters left behind. And you don't want that, you want a nice smooth bone. So we might take an actual bone file and file down the edge of the bone to make it nice and smooth. Then we have to take care of the artery. To do that, we'll take an instrument called a tenaculum, shaped like a fish hook. We'll put some silk thread over this, and with this hook, we'll grab hold of the artery, put a slip knot over it, and tie it off as tight as we can. When we do that though, we also want to make sure we leave enough silk thread so when we close the wound, a piece of it is sticking out. Now that takes care of the artery. To take care of the minor blood vessels, we need something called alum. And there's two ways to apply alum to the wound. You can either blow it on with a blow gun or mix this with water into a paste and brush it on. Either way, this alum will cause the minor blood vessels to pucker up and close off. To test it, we can loosen the tourniquet. If there's no bleeding, then we hope everything is fine. We'll now take that two inch flap of skin, we'll fold it down over the wound, sew it shut, put a bandage over it, hold the whole thing in place with a piece of adhesive strip, take the tourniquet off, and by that time this soldier should be coming out of the operation. Doctors said they could do an operation like this in about 15 or 20 minutes. So one operation they do all the time, so they get fast, just by repetition, and then learning all the shortcuts. Also because the soldier's now gone through an operation, we're not going to put him out here in the field. We're going to put him inside the barn. But keep in mind where we are. The operations are done probably in a barnyard, and we're going to put this guy in a barn, where there used to be cows, and what do cows leave behind? Manure. Manure. So nobody's come around to clean that stuff up before we set up the hospitals. So the dog just could be walking around this operating table in water, mud, blood, manure, and everything else. But hopefully when this soldier is placed in the barn, we can at the least put him down on a clean blanket. In a day or two, the doctors will go in, and that piece of silk thread we had sticking out, we're now going to pull on that. And what we should pull out is a dead, dry piece of artery. If that's what we've got, then everything should be fine. If we pull out what we determine to be a fresh piece of artery, that means the artery is not closed off. There's bleeding inside the wound. And we now have to take this poor soldier, bring him out, put him under again, and do a second operation to close off the artery. But hopefully everything went right the first time, and he'll be one of the first soldiers evacuated back to a general hospital. Where his bands will be changed twice a day. He's going to get good food, good drinking water, lots of big, wide open windows to let fresh air in. He'll be fitted with an artificial limb, taught how to use it, and then discharged from the Army. Okay? Hey, guys did a good job. Thank you. You okay? At the Gettysburg, Dr. Brunel would continue to serve with 106th Pennsylvania. 
in February of 1864, he's assisting at another operation. Now, this one was a soldier who'd been hit in the head. And he not only had a fractured skull, they discovered there were pieces of the skull laying on top of the brain. So now his job was to go in and remove those pieces from the top of the brain. Now keep in mind this is back in the day for doctors wearing gloves. So it's all barehanded surgery. And while Tornell is removing those pieces of bone, he scratched his hand on the skull. The hand becomes infected and the infection starts to travel up his whole arm to the point where he loses the use of his arm. He's going to come under the care of his brother, who's a doctor, in Baltimore, Maryland. Despite the best efforts of the brother, Dr. Justin Runell passed away on December 9, 1871, at the age of 49. Sir, a relatively young doctor. The man in charge of all the hospitals here, after the Army's left, reported that Dr. Dunell failed not to meet each difficulty as it arose with untying patience and determined perseverance, never resting with the excuse that he was doing the best he could while anything better was possible. At the end of his final report on Gettysburg, Dr. Donnell became very philosophical about the war and all the suffering he's seen here on the battlefield. He concluded his report by writing, in a great hospital as this has been, in spite of every precaution that can be devised by man and all that can be done to relieve distress of body and mind, there must always be a vast amount of suffering which God alone can relieve. This is one of the conditions of war. It is the price of liberty. I want to thank you folks for joining this afternoon for the Care of the Wounded program. I'll be here for a few minutes in case you have any questions. But once again, I want to thank you for joining me today and for coming to Gettysburg. Thank you. Thank you.